All right, we've got a lot of ground to cover tonight. Um, we are going to be trying to cover three individuals tonight, and so uh, I'm hoping that we can. We really, before we go into our, our missions quarter, that's going to be in uh, three weeks. So we've got two, uh, two Sunday nights for us to cover six individuals. And so I know, um, I, I feel like this is going to be a really good focus. And, and because Nathaniel really was our last individual who had more information about him. You know, for instance, you couldn't have tried to handle Peter and, you know, and, and, uh, and John and James in one. Uh, for instance, because there's so much information. But we're going to be focusing on, uh, on Matthew, on Simon the Zealot, and on Judas Iscariot tonight. Uh, he actually gives a whole, whole chapter to Judas Iscariot, but I'd like for us to, to try to put this together. Um, when we talked about the devotional, I, I wanted it to kind of link to this because it gave me some more time. Uh, but this, this idea of 12 ordinary men because they are willing to hear the message of the Messiah where the elite, they considered, they were, they were really blind to the truth and they, their, their, their hearts had grown dull. They weren't willing to actually listen to the message of Jesus. And so there's probably no three individuals who, more, who were more notorious than these individuals. That's why I have lumped all three of them together uh, because... Jesus did come to call sinners. And so Matthew would be, I'd say, the most notorious for the one who needed the second chance Messiah. So, you know, that's where we're going to be focusing tonight. And so I've got here in this list, uh, we've got, um, uh, we, we have uh, Matthew placed here. Um, if you'll notice, you've got uh, Matthew placed. He's in the second, the second grouping and so um, it's interesting, there's not much that we know about him, even though we have an entire book that's written by him concerning the life of Christ. And there's a reason for that. It's the life of Christ, not the life of Matthew. But two, it helps us understand a little bit more about him in that he is a humble, a humble individual because in the book that, has, that bears his name, there's only two mentions of his name. And it's within this list from Matthew 10, 2 through 4. His name is mentioned. And the other is when he is called. And so that's Matthew 9, 9 through 13. Who, who has that? And uh, Christian's going to be going around with the microphone. Who's got Matthew 9? Uh, yeah, thank you, sir, Steve. Matthew 9, 9 through 13. <clears throat> And as Jesus passed from, from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And he came to pass, as Jesus sat at the meeting in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when his Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why do even your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. And I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but, call, but sinners to repentance. Amen. Uh, we actually used this this morning kind of as a, a precursor to this class, uh, but it actually helped me kind of, um, you know, delve into this without having to go into the Luke's account of this when he calls Matthew Levi. And that's his second name, very similar to Paul and Saul, as we've already seen. Um, and like Nathaniel and Bartholomew, for instance. Uh, but Luke's account brings out that it was actually Matthew who threw the party to the feast to invite Jesus to his house and invite the guests. So it's interesting, Matthew doesn't say anything about that. It, you know, he's not going to sit there and say, well, uh, I threw a feast for the Messiah at my home, my abode. You know, you're not going to see him do that. And so it does show a humility that you don't get that part of the story. And I think that's, that is also very good. But have you ever stopped to think, why would Matthew, the moment Jesus calls him, he comes to this, this tax office, and, and again, it's, this, it's a booth that's there. And we're going to look at just a little bit as to what this booth really was in just a second. But Jesus calls him, and he gets up, and he leaves. 
why would he do that? Because you almost think that there's, there's got to be something more to this. Uh, but, you know, that brings us to the second part. We know that he's a tax collector, right? So he's a tax collector. He is sitting in this tax office. And I've got Luke 18, 10 through 14. All right, that's fantastic. Michael's got that. All right, Christian's coming. There you go. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Thank you very much. Have you ever stopped to think what, what caused this tax collector to be standing afar off? Notice the Pharisee standing by himself. He has that luxury. But you also have a tax collector who is standing far off. It's very possible he's actually standing in the outer court where the Gentiles stood because a tax collector was excommunicated from the synagogue. Remember in John chapter 9 when the man who was born blind is healed and his parents are afraid of the, of the not the Sanhedrin, of the Pharisees because they're afraid what? They're going to be put out of the synagogue. Well, that's exactly what happens to the man who was once born blind and he was healed by Jesus. When he goes to, when, he's getting, when he gets interrogated and just uses logic, no one has ever healed a man who was born blind, they cast him out of the synagogue. Oh yeah, well you're not going to be able to come to study. That's what happened. So the tax collectors were literally not allowed to come to the synagogue. And that's not the temple. That would be 10 Jewish men were, in, were required to be present for it to be a synagogue, a gathering of the Jews to study the law. So what we read in the, the devotional, Jesus was handed, when he went to Nazareth, he went to the synagogue as was his custom. He was handed a scroll of Isaiah. That's what they're doing. They're simply studying the law. But a tax collector, because of the choices he's made, cannot go and study the Bible. If you were ever like told you can't go study the Bible, you can't go study the law, that's going to cause you to go, man, everyone I know, especially Matthew, who is Levi, who is, who is a Jew, every time they would go to study, his family, his friends, everyone he knows, they're going and he cannot because of the choice that he's made. I wonder how many times he sat in that tax booth and said, I have made a terrible mistake. Because think about it. Sure, he had a house that he paid for. He had, he had food enough, money enough to buy the food in order to, to pay for everything when he invited his friends over. But he needed that second chance. Jesus provided that because Jesus wouldn't excommunicate him. And so that, I think that's very important uh, as to why he was willing to just get up and go. Very possibly he's heard about this Messiah as he's been sitting in this tax office. Rick. Are you going to expand on him getting up out of a Roman tax booth and just leaving his post? Right. So, yes. So that's interesting. The Roman tax booth, it was, the Romans provided a, an opportunity for people to, uh, to take a bid on a specific district, right? So you would have a chief tax collector, and Zac Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. And so he would be in charge of a certain region. Well, that chief tax collector would actually pay smaller tax collectors, and I actually have that uh, here, you had two different kinds of tax collectors, the Gabai and the Moks. So the Gabai, they were, they collected property, income, and poll taxes, and these were set amounts, and basically left, less graft was con conducted on these levels. There wasn't any extra that they could line their own pockets. So the Gabai, they weren't, they were not the notorious tax collectors, but the Moks, they, and again, I didn't make up these names. I just wrote them down, okay? But it's M-O-K-H-E-S too, which is very strange. Uh, but they were, they were broken up into two categories. You had the great mokes and the little mokes. The great mokes were the chief tax collector. So most likely Zacchaeus was a great moke. 
he was the one that had the, the, he had taken the bid from the Romans to be able to, to tax that region. But he would commission the smaller, the little mokes, they were the ones that were the, they would go and actually get the taxes. They were the ones that would be face to face. They would, and what's interesting is that kind of taxes, they would tax the axles on their uh, carts. The amount of, ta- you know, axles you had, you were taxed. Uh, they would tax any shipping out or receiving, right? So any fish that was to be, to be sold in the markets, they would tax them. And it was the little mokes that were the, they were the collectors. And they were the ones that you hated. They were the ones who were face to face. And they were the ones who could line their pocket. And it's interesting, in Luke 19, 2, Zacchaeus, when he says, If I have defrauded any one of anything, I repay fourfold. The fact that he is not the one that is face to face with everyone, there is an if there, because he's not been the one that is the, uh, I don't know, he, he, there's another word for it, you know, uh, he, he's not the minion, he's not the pawn <laughs> that goes and collects it. And so that if is very, very possible because he's the chief tax collector. But that means that Matthew, because he's sitting in a tax booth, he is sitting in a toll booth that is by the road where they were getting the, collecting the taxes. So Matthew is the tax collector that saw people face to face and he was the one that was hated the most. He's the one that collected the taxes on the fish when they were sold. Who, how many fishermen did he know? <laughs> Pretty soon, quite a few uh, as far as the apostles were concerned. And so he would have been notorious uh, as far as, as, as being this you know, um, this minion type, you know, mentality. So he personally taxed and imported all of those fish, and he would have been hated personally by many of the apostles. And Richard, you have something? I have yeah. just a, another side explanation of how he could abruptly leave his booth. Right. Uh, and John may have gotten to this already. I'm not being able to tune in much to the Sunday morning right. class. But this was the final call of a guy who had already been a disciple. Mm. So he had already planned to become, become into full-time service with Christ as the fishermen had through their multiple possible, right? encounters with Christ. So this was the day the final call came. It also would explain the party, he, the feast he threw. Right. I'm leaving, I'm becoming a full-time disciple from Jesus. Normally, a, a guy would get in a lot of trouble, I would think, if he would abruptly leave a Roman tax booth and just quit. Well, so what? that was kind of where my point was, Good and point. I think that's where the authors of the Life of Christ book take it. And all of right. these, many of these calls were graduated calls. They were partial disciples, but then they're called for full-time discipleship, and this was that full-time discipleship call. Right, and that's, and that's a good point. Um, when it comes to like what MacArthur brought out, this position that Matthew wanted, it, it, um, it would have been a clearly monetary decision that he made because he was excommunicated by his family and friends. He, there were a lot of people vying for that tax booth. So the moment he left it, that did mean he was never going back, but that meant somebody was able to come in right away and take up his job easily. Yes. Meryl? Right. So, right. My, um, and Christian's coming. Um, he's asking about the lining of the pockets. What, you know, how did that, you know, what did that go? Well, as far as, you know, the goodbye, there was a specific set rate that they were supposed to, to exact, and the Romans wanted to get theirs. They did not enforce if they were to get, to get anything else. And so these tax collectors, they would get the amount and make sure they gave it, but they could take anything they wanted. And that, so what they're doing is they're actually robbing from their own people. Not only are they exacting taxes to the Romans, but they're also taking even more than they're supposed to to line their own pockets. So that's actually how Matthew even had his house, most likely, uh, because right. of that. So there's a reason that they that, did. That's like what that. I was told. That's why they were so hated. It wasn't right. because they were taking the exact amount, because they were taking more. You know, they were taking more and cheating and defrauding their own people. So Zacchaeus, being a chief tax collector, is saying, "If I have defrauded, because he's a he is a chief tax collector. Well, the one who was face to face, 
You don't hear Matthew say if, but you don't hear, you don't hear him say anything like that. But what it is is, did you see the response to how can you have all of these tax collectors and sinners eating with them? Jesus says, I have come to call sinners to repentance. I have come because I am the physician to help the sick. And so he's, he says, I've come to call sinners. Well, he just called Matthew. So Matthew is a sinner. So we need to stop and realize he called Matthew, who is notorious for good reason, because he's a sinner. And so very good, very, I really appreciate the discussion. And I think as far as our, our next person, he's going to hate Matthew even more, Simon the Zealot. Uh, yes, uh, Jack, or Christian's coming. Jack, can you, what was that, sir? Do you think Peter, James, and John hated Matthew before it got started? Well, he is from Galilee. He is in the tax booth where they probably had to pay him every once in a while. There's no doubt they knew him, and they probably did, did not like him at first. But we don't have any of that information. But he was hated not just by the Pharisees, but by, by everybody. So that's important to, to bring out. Um, so he had a reputation as he comes. Uh, yeah, Bobby. He individually, because he would have been the one face to face because he's sitting in the tax booth. And this is a small, it's just like a toll booth. You're literally on the road. You're face to face with the person you're taking from. And so, yeah. We know the abuses of his office. Right. But we also know the abuses of some offices today, but we also know there's... Right, right. And I, you know, and I don't want to... I don't want to, 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 to make Matthew out to be the worst person in the world, but Jesus says, I've come to call sinners. And he just called Matthew. And so he is a sinner. And so we're, but I think it's important to understand there are some who were called zealots. And there were four different sects within the Jewish um, you know, hierarchy. You had the Pharisees, you had the Sadducees, the Herodians, and the zealots. The Pharisees were the ones who followed the law to its just nth degree, and they were just they just read it the way it was, and they followed it. Um, but when it came to they're now being conquered by the Romans, they would use that to their advantage. And so, if it was their advantage, they would bend it a little bit. They were they played the hypocrite, and that's. That's interesting because the zealots were much like the Pharisees. They followed the law and they did not bend on it. So that meant that the Romans that were conquering the Jews, there is no one who can be in charge of the Jews other than the Lord. And so they considered, they were, they were called zealots. They were named as that because they would try to overthrow the Roman government and they would do it overtly, but then they later did this with guerrilla warfare. Um, and so it's interesting how Simon was because what they would do is they would, they would literally, they would carry daggers in the fold of their, of their garment and they would come up behind a politician, a Roman soldier, a tax collector, and they would run them through. They'd kill them. And so that's what they were known to do. And so the fact that Simon is known as a zealot is, uh, is pretty notorious. Uh, and it's interesting, Matthew's list that he gives, Matthew and Mark are the only ones, notice where Simon the Zealot is placed. He is second to last, right next to Judas. <laughs> I wonder if Matthew had a, you know, no, I don't know. I, I don't know. But it's interesting that Simon the Zealot and Judas are placed together. And possibly when they were sent out two by two, this would indicate that Judas and Simon were partners together. Who, who knows? But we know that there, Simon the Zealot is, you know, within the list. You remember Peter is mentioned first, and it's almost this picture of he's the leader of all of them. And so that list, it wasn't just arbitrary. There was, there's a reason Judas is last. So there's a reason Peter is first. There's a reason Judas is last. There's a reason Simon is the uh, zealot is second to last. He, again, is a notorious individual, uh, but he's saved by grace. And very thankfully, Jesus called him. But they couldn't be two opposite 
on the spectrum between Matthew and Simon. And so I've got Acts 5, 35 through 37. Who's, who's got that? All right, Rick's got it. Is somebody going to read the rest of that section about Gamaliel's reply? Sir? Is somebody going to read the rest of that section about Gamaliel's reply? 30? Um, no, we'll just... Um, we've just got... The, okay. Uh, okay. Just got that. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, All fine. right. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you're about to do with these men. For before these days, Theudas rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so... Um, it is important for us to discuss. This is Gamaliel, who Paul sat at the feet of Gamaliel. And here we've got, you know, uh, we've got Peter and John, and, and they have, um, they've healed a man who uh, was born lame in Acts chapter 3. And they've been arrested, and there's this constant of being arrested and freed. And he says, be careful what you do with these men. You might be finding yourself going against God. Because there have been other uprisings, there have been other insurgents, and they rose and they came to nothing. And it's interesting, he mentions Ju this man by the name of Judas of Galilee. Um, Josephus, a Jewish historian, he claimed that Judas of Galilee was the founder of the Zealots, the party of the Zealots. And it's interesting that it would be during the census that this uprising took place. What was the census for? It wasn't just to number your people. It was so you number your people so you get taxes. And the zealots didn't want their taxes. Matthew. <laughs> and so that's that idea of, of, of this. Again, where was he from? Galilee. Where was Matthew from? Galilee. You've got to see there's a connection to these two. And what happened was there was an uprising that took place. And many people died as a result of this. And this is when that became a, an underground guerrilla warfare type. They went from not being overtly trying to overthrow the, the government, but to be um, covert. And very possible, the fact that Simon is known as a zealot, uh, and, and I meant to, to talk about this, in Matthew and Mark, it's, uh, does anybody have the King James Version for Matthew 10? And I think it's verse 4. Matthew 10, 4. I didn't hand that out. So if someone gets to it, Matthew 10, 4. Or ESV as well. We'll do it. Yeah. Simon the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Simon the Canaanite. All right. So the word for Canaanite here, it's actually more, it's actually mis, it's actually mistranslated to put Canaanite because it's more, um, uh, Kainios, which Kenian, it's Aramaic, and it meant enthusiast or zealous. So a zealot. So it was translated Canaanite, but it was it was not meant to be Canaanite. It's Kenian. So ESV actually puts Kenian, um, not Canaanite. And it makes sense that that would seem like it's from Canaan, but that's from a different region. It's actually meant Simon the Zealot, uh, Simon the um, what was the other word that, that I, I used? Enthusiast, right? So Luke uses the Greek uh, zelotes uh, in Luke and Acts within the list. So we know that this is Simon the Zealot. The fact that he's known as a zealot, and this is supposed to be underground at this point, shows he's pretty notorious that his, his name precedes him. Uh, and so... This, uh, let's see, it, it, let's, I had this. The fact that Simon was known as the zealot means that at one time he would have had no qualms about killing Roman soldiers, politicians, and especially Jewish traitor tax collectors like Matthew. So, and notice uh, I, I mentioned that about where Matthew places him. Um, but what's 
Interesting, though, is Jesus could take a tax collector, he could take a zealot. Because at the, bone, at the bare bones minimum, they were following the law, and they considered that God was the leader of the, the, the Jews, and therefore the Romans couldn't. And so they were willing to stand up for God, and they did this with zeal. They did this with passion, and they did this unashamedly and without hypocrisy. And that's truly important because that's not what a Pharisee did. But Paul was called as, as a, a Pharisee, uh, right? So God can take anyone, Jesus can take anyone from any walk of life, and their passion can be used for his glory. Jesus could match Simon's zeal, John 2, 15 through 17. All right, Saul. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. I wonder the smile on Simon's face as he watched Jesus do this. <laughs> zeal. There you go, zealos. Same word is used. Jesus had zeal. And so it's important for, for us to, to see this. But Jesus was able to curb his zeal to not overthrow the Roman government, but to be a fisher of men. All right, so we have Matthew, who is notorious tax collector, Simon, a notorious outlaw. It is only Jesus who can bring those two together, and that is profound. Um, now we've got Judas Iscariot, all right? So Judas Iscariot, the betrayer. His name, Judas, equals Jehovah leads. How ironic is that? That, that his name is a derivative of Judah, meaning Jehovah leads and Iscariot is a two, two words break, broken down into ish, meaning man, karyot, meaning karyoth. So a man of karyoth, and that probably meant Judas was, came from Kiriath hezron a small town south of Judah. And I think it's in Joshua chapter 25, you read Kiriath, um hezron And so he is the only apostle that's not from Galilee. He's from south of Judea, and it could be because of him being from another region. That is what caused him to be a standalone individual. Maybe, maybe he resented that. Maybe that's what caused him to want to, to, to what well, maybe led him to betrayal. Um, but I wanted us to, to discuss his name and then his call, his delusionment, his greed, his betrayal and hypocrisy, and then his death in nine minutes. All right, so, um, so his, um, that's, it's not going to happen, uh, but his call, uh, it's the only record is actually after the fact. We don't have a record of him being called, like from the tax booth or holding nets. We know that he was called, and uh, that brings us, let's see, uh, again, he's last, by the way, on every list except the Acts less list, he's not on it because he's already died at that point. And so there's a reason he's, he's last, because he is the most notorious. He is known as the most evil man who ever lived, if you stop and you think about it. Um, there was another man by the name of Judas, but do we call our children Judas anymore? It'd be the equivalent of calling him little Adolf. It'd be like the same kind of thing, because this man was notorious for what he did to the Messiah. Um, and we might pick up a little bit of this next week, just in case, if we don't pass, if we don't get to it in eight minutes, that's that's fine. Um, but John six uh, sixty four and sixty six through seventy one. Who's got that? All right, Tim's got it. But there are some of you that do not believe, for Jesus knew from the first who those were that did not believe, and who it was that would betray him. Mm. In verse 66, beginning, After this, many of his disciples drew back and no longer went about with him. Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know 
that you are the Holy One of God. Mm -hmm. Jesus answered him, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? Mm -hmm. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was to betray him. Right. Um, so again, this we know that his father's name was Simon. That's the only the only thing we know about his family. Uh, Simon, his father was Simon Iscariot, right? So that's his his given name is Man of Kirioth. So again, we know that Jesus chose him to be an apostle. It says, "I chose the twelve, and yet one of you is the devil." So Jesus knew. Jesus knew how Judas was. Uh, and what's interesting, too, though, is uh, this call was not just Jesus. This was a, this was a call that was prophesied. Uh, Psalm 41, 9 through 10. All right, Bob's got that. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. But you, O oh Lord, be gracious to me and raise me up that I may repay them. Mm. So Psalm 41, 9 through 10 is a quotation concerning the friend of Jesus who would lift his heel against him. Jesus calls him friend in John 13, 18. And, and that's quoted there. So this is a fulfillment of prophecy that it would even take place. Uh, Zechariah 11, 12 through 13. All right, Randy, is that you? Then I said to them, if it is agreeable to you, give me my wages, and if not, refrain. So they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, that princely price they set on me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. Mm. So did this not get fulfilled? Remember when Judas saw that Jesus was convicted? He was sorry, and he took the 30 pieces of silver, and he took it back to the Pharisees to say, what is that to us? You deal with it. And he threw it, and it went to the temple. They collected that money, and they bought the what with it? The potter's field. Um, Rick, you wanted me to do uh, 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 a potter. It's potter's field. Uh, the second service, he wanted me to do the J J Jimmy Stewart here. You know. All right. Uh, they, it was a fulfillment of prophecy here. And so that is exactly what Zechariah mentioned. That money was used, and that's the field where Judas was buried. Um, incredible connections here. So this, his call was also prophesied. Um, but when it comes to this, um, we were, what was it? Uh, I was talking with Gabriel in the car on the way home. And in class, they were talking about Joseph and his brothers and how they had put him in a pit and they sold him into slavery. And I said, man, how would you feel if James did that? And he's like, I'd take all his Legos and throw them away. <laughs> but I said, but what if you weren't able to be near your brother and, and, and all this? And I said, really? What? And we just had this conversation. And uh, I said, let's go to Gen Genesis 50 and look at the response. I think it's 15 and following. And he read it. And I said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Judas meant it for evil but God meant it for good. And we need to stop and realize that, yes, Judas made a choice to do this, even though it was prophesied that it would take place. He had a choice to do it. But he meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Um, three minutes. Okay. Um, so the next one is his delusionment. All right, so he's called, and, and again, he, he, I believe he, he considered Jesus the Messiah. But according to what they all thought, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus constantly showed that his Messiahship or the reward that they would receive was eternal, was spiritual, not physical. This brought more and more disillusionment. This brought uh, more frustration or disappointment on the part of Judas. Uh, Matthew nineteen twenty-seven through 29. Who's got that? See. Then Peter answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? So Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging 
the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. Mm. So Peter asks, we've left everything. What are we going to have? Judas is probably perking up and going, yeah, what are we going to have? His response is not something Judas wants to hear. Um, let's see. So that brings us to his greed. John 12, 2 through 6. And I realize we skipped Matthew 27, 9 through 10. I'm sorry, but we just kind of did it quick. <laughs> Here right. a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took him, took about a pint of pure nard, an uh, expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It's worth a year's wages. Mm -hmm. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was into it. So obviously he'd worked his way up into the ranks to be the money bag holder. They trusted him. So that shows he's a hypocrite. I mean, he was play acting the whole time. And when Jesus even mentioned about one of you is going to betray you, me, none of them goes, I know it's Judas. I know he did. I pointed at no one, by the way, <laughs> when I pointed. Uh, I pointed at the clock. Oh, man. Okay. So notice who's sitting there. Lazarus. What took place the chapter before? He was brought back from the dead, and Judas is sitting there wanting the money, not wanting the Messiah. Can he not see that the Messiah is worth more than any spikenard, any, any, any amount, especially more than 30 pieces of silver? Um, his betrayal and hypocrisy continued because he, if he'd gotten to that point, he was already going to go through with what he'd planned to betray. We read that in verse 5 of, of John 12. So in Matthew 26, 14 through 16, who's got that? All right, Joyce. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Man. For the cost of a, a, a male slave, 30 pieces of silver, that seemed good enough for him. I, I'm not getting anything with this, this Messiah. I might as well get something. And he now is going to seek an opportunity to betray him. That means this is going to take time. So that means he's plotting. So we need to realize he's not betraying Jesus on a whim. He's going to plan this out, and he's going to be back with them. And that we find in John chapter 13, um, and in and, and verse 1, when he's right there in the upper room, he's acted if nothing was wrong. He's already get received. He probably walked in with the ching, 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 clanging as he walked in. And he's going to plan out what he's going to do. And Jesus almost outs him as he's sitting there, and he leaves, and he goes and he betrays him. So the ultimate betrayal and hypocrisy was in Luke 22, 47 through 48. We can finish this if we, if we can do that. That'd be all right. <laughs> all right. And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude. And he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Mm. So the whole time he has been, to the point no one pointed a finger at him, this is only after the fact that they said that he was a betrayer, that, that he had, was a thief. They didn't know that at the, whole, the whole time. So he's a play actor, he's a hypocrite, and he continued that hypocrisy up to the very moment of kissing Jesus, which was an act of, of, of loyalty. It's an act of, of, of love, it's an act of... You know, during this time, that would have been a, that's something that a friend does. This is not what a betrayer does. And so he played that role up until the moment he kissed Jesus 
on the cheek. Disgusting. So the, um, he betrayed the Messiah with a kiss. And his death, Matthew 27, 3 through 5. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. Mm. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Mm. What a waste. He, 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 he um, betrayed Jesus for a pittance and then took that pittance and threw it away. He never even got to experience it. And, and it very well could be the moment he did it, he realized this wasn't worth it. He sees that when he saw that Jesus was, was actually convicted, so he had seen Jesus walk through the crowds. And it very well could be, Jesus is going to get out of it. I can get my 30 pieces of silver. And that might be the, the case. But he sits there and he realizes, I've done this. I, I see a remorse in him, but I don't see a willingness to repent. There's even a pride in it. He couldn't show his face. Peter was the opposite. Peter denied Jesus. The roast rooster crowed. John heard it. And he was still able to come back into the presence of the apostles and preach that Pentecost sermon. But you've got Judas. He had gone too far. And that's, that's where, that, um, where, where that went. And to this day, he is notorious as synonymous with betrayal. Uh, and so we'll, we'll pick up here and, and discuss a little bit. I, I wanted to look at some, kind of the moral of the story of Judas to begin our discussion next week. I appreciate you letting us go four minutes over. Can we go to God in prayer and then we'll be dismissed? Father God, we, we're so thankful for uh, this discussion for these 12 ordinary men. Uh, Father, for the examples that we see of what to do and what not to do. But Father, we're so thankful for forgiveness. We're thankful for, uh, for your life. And really, Judas shows an example of the grace and mercy of Jesus. Uh, and Father, help us to access his mercy. Help us to continue to serve Jesus in everything that we do this week. And uh, we know we can do that in, uh, when we put him first. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you all.